Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn how Western Iowa became an epicenter for short line railroads between 1907 and 1913. Multiple communities, including Atlantic, Clarinda, Creston, Red Oak, and Trainer, built independent carriers which failed in the 1920s and 1930s. Still, these railroads had a positive impact on their service areas and reflected the desire for better transportation before the triumph of motor vehicles and all weather roads. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Beyer, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, H. Roger Grant. Roger is a native of Albia, Iowa, and a graduate of Simpson University and the University of Missouri. Before moving to Clemson University in 1996, he taught for 26 years at the University of Akron. At Clemson, he has served as department chair and centennial professor, and since 2006, the Catherine and Calhoun Lemon Professor of History. Roger is the author or editor of 36 academic books, the latest being A Mighty Fine Road, The History of the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad Company, and The Station Agent, and the American Railroad Experience, both published by Indiana University Press. His next book, Sunset Cluster, a short line railroad saga, will be released this summer from Indiana University Press. He is presently writing a history of railroads in the Midwest. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Roger to begin the webinar. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'm happy uh, to have this opportunity uh, to share uh, my research and writing about uh, five obscure short line railroads in western southwestern Iowa, as you pointed out, between 1907 and 1913. Needless to say, uh, we should uh, keep in mind that there is a difference between a short line railroad and a branch line railroad. A branch line is simply an extension of a trunk line whereas a short line is an independent company. And uh, Iowa, like uh, all states in the United States, with the exception of uh, perhaps Alaska and Hawaii, have had short line railroads. Now, what I'm talking about this afternoon uh, involves uh, what I would call sunset or twilight uh, carriers. These were railroads that were built uh, during the last phase of railroad construction in Iowa, the Midwest, and for the most part, of the United States. Now, Iowa began the railway age, which lasted uh, technically from about 1840 uh, into the era of the Second World War. Railroads appeared uh, in the Hawkeye State uh, in the 1850s, but there is going to be an explosion of trackage route miles after uh, the Civil War. Uh, by 1870, uh, Iowa had uh, more than 2,600 miles of railroad. By 1880, that increased to 4,700 miles. 1890, there was a major increase to 8,300 miles. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, we had 9,300 miles, 1910, uh, 9,700 miles, and Iowa railroad mileage peaked in 1914 with 10,019 miles. And that made the state uh, having uh, the fourth largest railroad mileage in the United States behind Pennsylvania, Illinois, 
and Texas. And needless to say, uh, Iowa is not as large as those three states uh, just mentioned. And Iowa claims, and this is probably correct, that by 1913, 1914, it was only 13 miles from any point to a railroad station with probably a full-time agent, at least one that was working during the daylight uh, hours. So Iowa certainly is a state with a massive railroad uh, infrastructure. So this afternoon, I want to talk about these five railroads. But let me just note that uh, major roads, I'll call them trunk roads, were still building in the state, but not that extensively. For example, in 1913, the Rock Island uh, would uh, build uh, between uh, Carlisle and Allerton to complete a uh, through route from Kansas City, Des Moines, Mason City to the Twin Cities. So these short lines uh, are a part of obviously a larger railroad construction picture, but as I pointed out, it's petering out on the eve of World War I. So this afternoon, I want to look at the Atlantic Northern and Southern. It's the largest of these, 54 miles long, that goes from Kimbleton to Elkhorn to Atlantic to Grant uh, to Villisca. And then I want to look at the Iowa and Southwestern, frequently called by residents of Page County the Ike. We're not sure of the origin. It might have been a derogatory term. And it was 18 miles long that ran from uh, Clorinda to College Springs to Blanchard. Then uh, we'll look at a slightly larger short line, the Creston, Winterset, and Des Moines. I think you could tell uh, where it was destined, but it only uh, reached uh, Maxburg, uh, 21 miles from the Union County uh, seat, Creston. And then we'll look at a tiny short line, 12 miles, it was uh, the Iowa and Omaha short line that went from trainer uh, to a connection with the Wabash at a station called Neoga, N-E-O-G-A, which probably wasn't much more than a siding, and maybe there was a general store there. And then uh, I'll look at uh, a short line that never turned a wheel. It was the uh, Des Moines and Red Oak Railway. It uh, was planning to go from Red Oak to Des Moines, about 100 miles. But for a variety of reasons, as I'll point out, it uh, decided uh, to build uh, to the southwest, uh, to build 18 miles from Red Oak to Imogene, uh, which is located in Fremont uh, County. Uh, it was graded, uh, but uh, track was never laid. And needless to say, uh, it never got much beyond uh, uh, the good idea or the paper uh, construction uh, uh, perspective. So let's uh, look at uh, these uh, five railroads, four of which uh, did uh, begin operation in uh, southwestern Iowa. And also, what I want to do at the end is to say, you know, the so what? Why are these important? Why is anybody? Uh, spending time uh, researching and writing about these uh, obscure roads. Now, the granddaddy of the group, as I pointed out, was the Atlantic Northern and Southern. And uh, Atlantic Iowa, seat of Cass County, had good railroad service. It was on the main line uh, between uh, the uh, Quad Cities, Davenport, uh, Iowa City, uh, Des Moines, and Omaha. Council Bluffs area, and it had two branches, one that was uh, opened about 10 years after the main line appeared in 1869, that went to Audubon, and then in 1880, an extension was built uh, southwest to Lewis and Griswold. Now, there had been discussion in Atlantic for uh, an option to the Rock Island. There was at a time a feeling that uh, it's not good for a community to be dominated by a single carrier. So there were ideas floated about building an electric interurban. And in the early 20th century, uh, we have the uh, interurban uh, 
era where we have uh, these electric uh, uh, cars, sometimes uh, freight motors that operated between cities. The first in urban dates from the late 1880s, it was in Ohio and actually Ohio and Indiana become the uh, heartland uh, for the uh, electric interurban uh, craze. There would be a group, actually two men, outside promoters who uh, were sort of the ringleaders behind a building in interurban between Red Oak and Atlantic. Uh, for a variety of reasons that never materialized, but these two individuals who were uh, the officers and the only, I think, full-time employees of a tiny Chicago-based company called Engineering Construction and Securities Company. A Clarence Ross, the president, and Charles Judd, who was the uh, chief engineer. And uh, these individuals looked at Iowa as a good place to build interurban. And uh, before, uh, they left the state, they were successful. Uh, they built uh, an interurban uh, that ran uh, from Oskaloosa to uh, Beacon. It was called uh, the Oskaloosa and Buxton Electric Interurban Railway. Uh, Beacon was only a few miles from Oskaloosa, but uh, Buxton was a large uh, African-American mining community that was unincorporated, uh, located in Monroe County that had maybe 6,500 residents at one time. They also built the Albion Urban Railway, which uh, served uh, the mining camps uh, of Riserville and Hawking to the south of Albion. It was only several miles long. And also uh, it reached the Heitman, which was operated by the Wapalo Coal Company that had a population of about 2,000 to 2,500. So they did have a track record. And uh, when the proposed interurban between uh, Atlantic and Red Oak uh, collapsed, they realized that uh, there were residents uh, in uh, Elkhorn and Templeton that desperately wanted not to be inland or isolated communities. And so uh, to get to the point, uh, we find uh, of the organization of the Atlantic Northern and Southern Railway. And their first efforts uh, will be to build towards Kimbleton, although they thought maybe they would go as far as Manning and Carroll County because it uh, had three trunk roads that uh, served uh, that uh, town. Eventually, uh, 1907, they do get uh, to Elkhorn uh, on uh, Christmas Eve, 1907. Uh, but in order to uh, get uh, tax uh, support from uh, uh, local uh, governmental units, uh, there was a deadline. And this was always the case when you had a uh, township or a community uh, vote uh, for uh, tax support. Uh, sometimes it would be uh, uh, 1% of taxes for a certain period of time, but usually it was 5% for one, two, or even five years. So this is important. So they had to get to Kimbleton. Well, they had to race the clock and uh, they barely made the deadline of December 31st, 1907. And uh, what the, the town uh, fathers of Kimbleton did was to uh, extend the boundaries of the uh, a town, which is a large village, uh, to meet uh, the rails that were coming in uh, from uh, Elkhorn. But what is important, I think, here is that the communities uh, of Elkhorn and Kibbleton uh, were incredibly supportive of railroads. Uh, it was dominated by Danish immigrants. And uh, although uh, there was a difference of religious viewpoints between Elkhorn and Kimbleton, uh, Elkhorn had more conservative uh, Danish Lutherans. Kimbleton had a more liberal sect. And as I said, uh, Elkhorn had the Holy Danes and Kimbleton uh, had the Happy Danes. But whatever Danes, they were willing to reach into their pocketbooks and also vote taxes to support a short line railroad. 
and they came to the rescue of the Atlantic Northern and Southern and its uh, new company, the Atlantic Northern, after the Atlantic Northern and Southern uh, broke apart in 1913. So we find that with the arrival of the steam car civilization, there was an expansion in both of these communities, uh, one in Audubon County and uh, one in uh, Cass County. And uh, this is going to be the story of all of these short lines that once they appear, once they start operating, there will be expansion of these communities and there will be new ones that will try to come into being permanently. But remember, this is at the very end of the uh, railroad era. People are uh, going to uh, be using uh, motor cars, automobiles, if you will, and uh, trucks. But let me just note that one of the reasons why these inland communities wanted to be connected to the National Railroad Network is the fact that Iowa had awful roads, and I verbally underscore awful. Uh, one that I uh, comment that I uh, found that I thought really uh, expressed it all uh, came uh, early in the 20th century. Uh, the editor of the Red Oak Express uh, had this uh, comment. This week, a farmer walked four miles to town with a basket of produce. This week, a farmer's wife drove to town with her butter. And most everybody in town heard of it because it was the only country butter received here the past week. The bad roads have well nigh cut off the country from the town and the town from the country. Bad roads have hindered the marketing of produce, stopped the delivery of rural mail, and put a damper on business. So Iowa had its uh, thousands of miles of road that uh, uh, in the wet season were nothing but vicious and viscous mud. And in the dry season, you had ruts. Uh, it wouldn't be until 1911 that the first uh, rural a uh, pavement uh, was installed in the state. So we're going to have to wait for the good roads movement. And I thought it was kind of interesting that a tech, uh, that a Creston physician in 1906, who just bought an automobile, automobile, uh, said to one of the local newspapers, now, why am I going to drive this? Uh, obviously, he could do it in Creston, and he could go out at times uh, into the hinterlands uh, with the automobile. So by necessity, how are you going to shatter your isolation? You really need to have an automobile. And after 1904, with the invention of the truck, first appearing uh, uh, in the East, New York City had some of the earliest uh, trucks in operation. Uh, we're going to have to wait quite a while to make sure that uh, farmers can get their grain and their livestock to market and uh, consumers and communities can get things like uh, lumber and coal uh, without uh, the expense of overland uh, dredge. So the Atlantic Northern and Southern, by the name, we built the northern part, let's build the southern part. And that's to Villisca, an extension that was poorly engineered. It was poorly built. And uh, should I say, uh, that was out of necessity. There just wasn't enough money really to build a uh, high grade trunk line type branch. So uh, we find uh, construction beginning in the summer of 1910, and uh, eventually it gets uh, to uh, Grant uh, uh, by uh, Christmas. And Grant is a relatively large inland town that has been isolated. And for about 50 years, it was originally called Milford, it had been attempting to get a railroad, but unsuccessfully. And uh, when uh, the rails arrive uh, uh, at Christmas time, uh, 1910, uh, there was a great celebration. And uh, soon uh, we find uh, the uh, line uh, being, uh, uh, being built up north uh, from uh, Villisca uh, through Morton Mills, which is also going to experience a, a small boom with the arrival of uh, rails. And there will be a silver spike ceremony uh, south of Grant uh, 
on December 27, 1910. And in, when I can tell, it's the only silver spike type ceremony, not unlike what occurred at Promontory, Utah on May the 10th of 1869. But almost immediately, there is community development. Now in Cass County, north of uh, Grant, which is in uh, Montgomery County, uh, we find that stations uh, were established at Maker, at Galleon, and at Lyman. Not much at Maker, there was a depot, stockyard, that type of thing, a coal yard even. And uh, ditto uh, for uh, the uh, next community, Galleon, but Lyman had a little more growth. It was uh, a general store and also a blacksmith shop uh, and even a church. So yes, here we are talking about short distances between these uh, little towns that have propped up, hamlets if you will, because this is the time that we have the team hall thesis or notion. And that meant you need closely spaced communities because you want to be able to have farmers be able to go to a country store or whatever or to a stockyard uh, within one day uh, to and from. And uh, so, as I said, closely spaced communities uh, made a lot of sense. And uh, Morton Mills, uh, like Grant, uh, exploded. Grant uh, got everything from a three-story uh, schoolhouse to a newspaper, the Grant Chief, that began publication almost immediately after the Iron Horse came to town. And Morton Mills, uh, uh, only four miles south of Grant, uh, expanded, and it had a summer Chautauqua that lasted for seven days, being the smallest community, arguably, in the United States to have a seven-day Chautauqua event. So the railroad uh, was not a moneymaker. And uh, to get to the point, uh, it goes into a receivership. And uh, after uh, a fight with the Iowa Board of Railroad Commissioners and uh, in the courts, it is broken into two parts, the Atlantic Southern, which will be controlled by a uh, one of the debtors uh, who sees it as a way to make money, to speculate, and that's exactly what he does. And uh, the Atlantic Southern, which operates from Atlantic uh, to Villisca, uh, will be uh, ending its service uh, in uh, 1913. Um, it's a financial disaster, certainly for the investors and the taxpayers and places like Grant that supported it. Now, to the north, we have the Atlantic Northern, and as I'll point out later, it will last until uh, 1936. In fact, uh, let's look at a few uh, images of the Atlantic Northern right before uh, it uh, closed. Uh, you will notice this is the headquarters building uh, in uh, Atlantic, uh, obviously a little weed grown, but this was taken about 1931. Next image. Talk about using uh, Yankee uh, uh, ingenuity. Uh, this was a motor car that was used to haul mail and express and also students who were going, uh, uh, let's say from one of the communities, a little stops along the road, uh, to uh, the high school in Atlantic. Uh, it's a Model T that has a wooden contraption installed on top. Unique, and I use the word unique. Next. Here we have a typical short line railroad concept with an American type locomotive, a 440. The drivers uh, are those bigger wheels. And look, it has mostly stock cars. And that's what sort of kept the Atlantic Northern uh, going until the middle part of the 1930s. But then, of course, uh, uh, trucks were available, all red weather roads were improved, and uh, yes, uh, the end of the Atlantic Northern. But it lasted longer than any of these uh, short lines. Well, let's next go to the uh, Iowa and Southwestern uh, Railroad, uh, which was located entirely in Page County. And uh, there are several reasons uh, for its appearance. 
Uh, Clorinda was dominated by the Burlington Railroad. It had various branches. Um, it had uh, a, essentially a second uh, main line across Iowa that cut through uh, Clorinda, which was the Humiston and uh, um, uh, Railroad. Uh, Humiston uh, uh, was uh, a, a major, uh, or I should say a minor uh, point on the railroad and also the KFF in Western. So uh, it had that and it had branches. Uh, uh, in fact, two of them went down to the St. Joseph area. So what we have in Corinda is a monopoly. And uh, the Burlington Railroad was relatively arrogant. Uh, there were problems about rates and service and uh, uh, two of the largest businesses in Clorinda, uh, the A. Berry Seed Company and the Lee Electric Light Company were not happy campers. And then we have College Springs. College Springs was probably the largest inland town in Iowa at the time. Uh, LeClaire was, had just received an interurban, uh, uh, LeClaire being uh, in uh, the eastern part of the state in the Quad Cities area. Anyway, College Springs had about 400 residents, 500, it was bigger than Grant, but it also had a college, a United Presbyterian school called Amity College, and it had several hundred students. And it just desperately wanted a railroad, and it thought that it was going to get one earlier, but the Burlington decided to build west from uh, uh, Clorinda through uh, Page Center and uh, Coin, where it interchanged with the uh, Wabash and then went on uh, to uh, uh, points uh, southwest. Now, Blanchard was on the Wabash. It had relatively good service, but residents of Wabash, if they wanted to, of uh, Blanchard, if they wanted to go to the big city of Clorinda, they'd have to go on the Wabash to Coin and then get on a, Bur a Burlington train, but the depots were not nearby. And it probably meant an overnight stay in Clorinda. And they wanted a direct route. Also, shippers, farmers in the area, wanted to be able to send their livestock directly to Chicago rather than using the Wabash that went down uh, into central Missouri and then to St. Louis and then to Chicago. But there were other packing plants, obviously, uh, in the area. So that explains uh, why we have the uh, formation of. Uh, the Ike, and uh, our friends uh, Mr. Ross and Mr. Judge were instrumental in uh, pushing for this. It took time to get uh, the money raised, uh, but finally, finally on December 31st, 1911, uh, we find uh, that uh, the railroad gets into Clorinda, but barely, uh, and uh, they are able to take advantage of a rather uh, a handsome tax that the residents of Corinda had voted. But the railroad was not built to high standards, It's much like the Atlantic Northern and Southern. In fact, uh, I uh, enjoyed a comment uh, that was made by a uh, local resident of uh, Clorinda. In fact, he was probably the poet laureate of uh, the uh, Page County Capitol. And this was on New Year's Day, 1912. There was a free excursion to take people from um, Clorinda down to College Springs uh, to uh, Blanchard. Anyway, as he wrote, "'Twas on a winter evening, the snow was falling down, the Iowa and Southwestern came whistling into town. The smoke was rolling high, the rails of steel were laid. The taxes on deposit to the railroad will be paid. The track is rather rolly, so there's a reason for the fact that if we rode to Blanchard, we'd be glad to hoof it back. So uh, it was not uh, an airline uh, railroad in the sense that it was all that comfortable. It was a direct railroad, though, between Clorinda, College Springs, and Blanchard. But uh, it was badly managed. Uh, there were lots of problems with the Burlington. They wouldn't allow uh, proper rate divisions. They did not allow a, a reciprocal switching, uh, whatever. But the point of the matter is that uh, the uh, company uh, tried desperately to keep afloat. 
complained to the Iowa Board of Railroad Commissioners and got support, but the Interstate Commerce Commission simply did not make a good decision about rate divisions. And uh, as a result, uh, the railroad uh, falls into bankruptcy. Uh, one of the receivers uh, gets a hold of it uh, after a year. And uh, um, to make a long story short, it's not a happy one, uh, certainly for residents of College Spring, uh, that um, it just can't be saved. Uh, the Wabash Railroad was interested, but they realized that uh, it was badly built and uh, it was really only the right of way. And that right of way was subject uh, to uh, rock slides. 1915, 16 were very wet years. And so in the fall of 1918, uh, the Iowa and Southwestern becomes uh, history. And uh, it's going to be uh, ripped up. And uh, fortunately, uh, for those people that had a financial interest, although the original stockholders were wiped out by the reorganization, uh, scrap prices were high. And uh, that uh, certainly uh, made it a little more palatable uh, for an abandonment. So uh, if you're going to abandon a railroad in the early part of the 20th century, 1917, 1980, 1918, a good time. 1920, going to be a, a more difficult period. Now, let's look at the Crest and Winterset in Des Moines. Um, again, here we have a, a county seat town like Clorinda that's dominated by one railroad, in this case, the Burlington, or the Q, as it's often called. And Maxburg is like College Springs. It's an inland community. And it desperately wanted a railroad. The town uh, dated back to 1872, but it just did not have uh, that railroad connection. Uh, the Great Western uh, had built a line in the general area, but it went through Lorimer and Aristi and so forth. It had missed Creston and much to the disgust of uh, Creston residents. So uh, again, uh, we have our friends, uh, Mr. Ross and Mr. Judge who are involved. And um, there is the hope of building this as an electric interurban, but uh, it was decided uh, after a few years by uh, 1911 that it's just not practical. It's gonna be a lot cheaper to build a steam railroad. There's a lot of uh, steam locomotives that are available directly from railroads and from uh, uh, dealers that are much cheaper than installing uh, uh, a power system and substations uh, and the like. So uh, eventually uh, the railroad is built, but it only goes as far as Maxford. Although there is the dream of uh, going to Winterset, which is dominated by a uh, piece of branch line trackage owned by the Rock Island, and also going to Des Moines. And Des Moines uh, businessmen uh, are thinking that maybe this isn't a bad idea, but uh, their support is uh, meager to say, the, to say the least. Well, this railroad does get to uh, Maxburg, uh, uh, barely. It was not unlike uh, Kimbleton on December 31st, 1912. But this railroad has a big problem. There is the West Maxburg Hill and the line coming up from the Grand River Valley into Maxburg is 5%. And this is the steepest grade of any railroad line ever built in Iowa. Now I'm excluding some of the interurbans and, and streetcar lines, but the point of the matter is uh, this was a tough deal. And uh, the company uh, did buy a ditcher and they tried to lower the grade and tried to control the bank, but uh, West Maxburg was a problem. But uh, the railroad just hemorrhaged uh, finances, money through its uh, career. Um, it never made money and it goes bankrupt. And uh, there's gonna be a long legal fight about uh, abandonment. Uh, part of it will uh, be uh, abandoned in 1918, but uh, it won't be until 1920 that the rest of it can be abandoned. The case even goes to the Supreme Court. But keep in mind, that the appearance of the Creston Winterset in Des Moines 
uh, which had an unusual nickname. It was called uh, the Crazy Willie and the Dandy Molly. Uh, the Little Willie is the common or preferred nickname, shortened, but weird. Uh, but anyway, like in Grant, where we had the newspaper, the chief established, we see a newspaper coming to uh, Maxburg as well as lumber yards and so on. So there is the Maxburg Independent, which gives us a lot of insight into uh, what is happening uh, with the railroad. And uh, the editor was trying to figure out ways to ensure that Maxburg would not lapse back into being an inland community. Uh, there was talk of building a, a line, uh, uh, not only to Winterset, but maybe we could connect with a Great Western or uh, whatever. Uh, there was hope until the very end, which just shows you the kind of optimism and boosterism that are part of this short line story. Now let's look at the smallest one, the Iowa and Omaha Short Line Railway. Uh, and you might say it goes from nowhere to nowhere in particular. It goes from Trainer, which is uh, East Central Pottawatomie County, uh, to a connection with the Wabash. And I might note that the Wabash, unlike the Burlington, has been really friendly uh, to the short line uh, carriers that connect with it, like the Iowa and Southwestern, uh, in part because uh, they saw it as a way of uh, having a sphere of influence into Burlington country, and they could get car loading, and they wouldn't have the uh, expense of building and maintaining a, a railroad. So a trainer uh, had been missed. Uh, Pottawatomie County had plenty of railroad, uh, main line of the uh, Rock Island and the uh, Burlington, but poor trainer, it didn't have any. And uh, people would have to uh, haul down to Silver City who wanted a railroad connection and bring stuff back. And uh, to make a long story short, the Iowa and Omaha uh, short line is the only one of these short line carriers in Western Iowa that didn't seek tax support, like from uh, the townships, the two townships uh, that the uh, Iowa and Southwestern or the Iowa and Omaha short line, get the railroad straight, uh, served. Uh, wealthy farmers bankrolled the railroad. In fact, uh, according to the uh, Council of Bluffs non Perel, that uh, these farmers were, quote, the wealthiest farmers in Western Iowa. Now, it may not have been true, but they did sink a lot of money into this railroad. Uh, one man by the name of Henry Zarr, S-A-A-R, invested about $98,000. And if you uh, look at the equivalent in present day dollars, it's about 2.3 million. That's a lot of money. And uh, Zar wanted to be able to move his livestock to uh, the Omaha, South Omaha um, packing plants and also uh, saw that uh, his land would become more valuable with a direct railroad connection. In fact, he thought of subdividing some of his acreage into creating a new town. Now, just keep in mind that uh, Trainer was only 12 miles from that uh, Wabash connection, but uh, maybe uh, this would be appropriate to have another little town pop up like a maker uh, there in Cass County along the ANS. But this railroad was uh, never making money. And uh, it was hoped that maybe it could become electrified. In fact, originally they thought of building an interurban, but it just didn't work out. Uh, there was an extension of uh, the Council Bluff Street Railway uh, down to the uh, state uh, school for the deaf. And it was thought maybe this could be connected. Then we have a cockamamie scheme led by uh, former governor uh, Leslie Shaw. Uh, and also served uh, as U.S. Treasurer in the uh, uh, 
Theodore Roosevelt administration of building an interurban from Des Moines to Council Bluffs that would be uh, more direct than the competing main line of the Rock Island. And uh, there was an effort, complicated one, the greatest railroad story in Iowa, according to the non Perel, for example, of uh, uh, taking over the Atlantic Northern and Southern and also using the Iowa and Omaha short lines to build this interurban. Um, but money was invested uh, in uh, trying to uh, convince the court uh, that it should finalize this, but there were problems with the uh, uh, overseas, the foreign money market, and it never uh, materialized. So this company bled money and uh, it had sort of just sort of stopped in the middle part of 1916. Uh, it, uh, the, the track structure uh, was uh, incredibly poor. Uh, the locomotives, uh, the one that they had old uh, Ironside uh, was old, but it was not really serviceable. Uh, it leased motive power from the Wabash, again, showing that friendly connection. And uh, there would be a legal fight about uh, who would own it. Uh, and eventually a uh, successful uh, Council Bluffs uh, businessman uh, who was a building contractor, who was making money uh, constructing uh, uh, buildings uh, for uh, the federal government during the war. Uh, a man by the name of Edward uh, Wickham uh, got control and he said, well, he was going to keep it. Uh, he was maybe going to try to sell it to the Wabash. Maybe he was going to electrify it, uh, but uh, he scrapped it and uh, it uh, was uh, abandoned uh, in the latter part of 1917. But he did make a lot of money on his investment when he got control of the railroad. and. Uh, I guess left all the way to the bank. And as I said, scrap prices were increasing at this time. Well, let's look at the one short line that never turned that wheel, to use that phrase once more, which is the Des Moines and Red Oak Railway. Now, it wasn't named that until the end of its lifespan as such. It originally was called the Red Oak and Northeastern Interurban Promotion Company. That is a mouthful. And people locally called it uh, uh, the Red Oak and Des Moines or the Red Oak and Northeastern. So it was called the Red Oak and Northeastern Interurban Promotion Company. Well, it wanted uh, to be an interurban. And like what we uh, see uh, in uh, Clorinda and Creston, uh, Red Oak uh, businessmen and residents generally uh, wanted uh, to break the monopoly of uh, the uh, Burlington Railroad. It was on the main line of the CB&Q and also on branches uh, down to Hamburg and went up to Griswold, were connected with a Rock Island branch. So uh, there's a Q or Burlington stranglehold. So let's, how do we break it? So the idea was originally to build an interurban and the route change, but eventually it was to go from Red Oak to Greenfield in Adair County uh, to Winterset to Des Moines. And Des Moines business organizations thought this would be just wonderful. This would be sort of like the Creston Winterset in Des Moines, obviously, a direct way to tap that market. In fact, uh, it probably took longer to go from Red Oak to Des Moines, then it would go from Red Oak maybe to Chicago. I mean, it, there was not a direct route. Now you could change uh, maybe at, at Helmage Junction uh, outside of Creston, east of Creston, and go on the Great Western, but you know, schedules were not in sync, et cetera. So it was quite an ordeal to make that trip. Now, much like the uh, Creston Winter set in Des Moines that started out at least at one point as the Creston uh, Winter set in Des Moines Electric Railroad Company, had that corporate name for about three years, that uh, 
the uh, backers of uh, this uh, inner urban uh, from uh, Red Oak to Des Moines, which is about 100 miles distant, uh, really backed out of it. And uh, the local uh, newspaper, The Express, pointed out that we're going to have a, a new inner urban car. Well, it was actually a gas mechanical car called a McKean car that was being uh, produced uh, in Omaha uh, by uh, William R. McKean Jr., who was the chief mechanical officer for the Union Pacific. And the Union Pacific bought quite a few of these. Uh, about 100 were manufactured. They were strange looking contraptions, sort of a submarine type thing with a pointed nose and a rounded tail. Uh, they had a mechanical system that really didn't work. Uh, they often broke down between stations. But this was a way of uh, having kind of interurban service, maybe uh, four, five, six trips a day over the line. And then what about freight? Well, some King cars, as they developed, as they were improved, uh, could haul two or three, uh, four freight cars. And these would be stock cars. Uh, you know, livestock cars. And uh, there was a railroad uh, in Minnesota that uh, did use McKean cars and had a modified McKean car that was impressed into freight service. So this was a possibility. Um, but there was really problem of getting the right finances. Now there would be some uh, support through uh, the sale of stock uh, and also the board of directors loan money uh, to the operation. And uh, actually uh, in 1911, it was decided that it's going to take time to get the finances arranged to build to Des Moines. So what are we going to do? Let's build to the Wabash to the southwest to Imogene uh, in Fremont County. And so the idea was to uh, build that addition. And then with the equipment that we buy to build it, we can use for the extension for the main line to Des Moines. Well, it is a complicated story, but about 18 miles would actually be built, including a large cut uh, called Jinx Cut right on the Montgomery uh, uh, Cass or Montgomery uh, Mills County uh, line. Uh, but the point is that they spent a lot of money uh, to build this part. And uh, then they wanted to get some tax uh, dollars locally. So, but West Township in uh, uh, the county uh, simply uh, said no. They voted down the tax levy. But uh, a few uh, weeks later, uh, there would be a vote in uh, Red Oak, and uh, we find that this is a rather bitter election, but uh, uh, the Murphy Calendar Company uh, got out uh, its uh, 200 uh, female employees, and it passed by a large margin. So uh, I might just note that uh, Iowans at that time, uh, uh, we did not have suffrage. But women could vote on tax issues if they own property or they were the wives of property owners. But there was a male ballot and a female ballot. Very interesting. So anyway, uh, what happens is that the support in Des Moines is flagging. Uh, there's no tax support. Uh, a winter set, there's that competition between the Creston winter set in Des Moines for financing and uh, it just isn't working out. So here we have more than a paper interurban. We have a railroad that's just partially built, but never used. So what do these short lines tell us? I mean, why spend the time dealing with it? Well, first of all, I think the promoters, the backers, they're, they're not crazy. Uh, nobody had a crystal ball to see what was going to happen in the world of land transportation. You know, the automobile, even after Henry Ford introduced the Model T in 1908, was you know, still sort of viewed as a plaything of uh, the rich or the people that are comforted or were adventuresome. Also, uh, it shows uh, the role of uh, 
these small uh, entrepreneurs who were promoting inner urbans and short lines uh, like uh, uh, Roth and Judd. Uh, the point is they were not charlatans. Uh, they saw a profit in doing these, usually sort of a 10% of uh, the cost of construction. Uh, and as I said, they had uh, success with at least two in urbans uh, in Iowa. And, and let's just keep in mind, and I'm sort of repeating myself, but uh, John Stover, uh, an historian late of uh, Purdue University, pointed this out, and I quote, when the Iron Road Network was built to completion in the half century before World War I, the nation needed nearly every railroad that was constructed. Now later, certainly in the post war II period, said we overbuilt the railroad network. Well, no, we probably didn't. Uh, also, these interurbans uh, also show the role of the government, you know, whether it's taxing by township or by uh, municipality. Uh, the Iowa Board of Railroad Commissioners were quite supportive of uh, these railroads. And uh, the Creston Winnesett in Des Moines had problems with the Burlington uh, in terms of car supply, uh, with a recipe uh, a reciprocal uh, a switching in Creston and also uh, with the rate division. But the Interstate Commerce Commission took forever and the Interstate Commerce Commission, at least in the case of the Ike, the Iowa and Southwestern, uh, really it was in free fall before the ICC got around to really making a final decision about issues of rate divisions, et cetera. And, uh, Certainly, folks, these short lines show us uh, about local boosterism and optimism. Uh, the uh, editor of one of the Clorinda papers said, boost, don't knock. You know, this is how Clorinda is going to outshine its competitor, Shenandoah, for example, and it's going to be sort of the, uh, the center of uh, commercial activities in southwestern Iowa. Oh, Red Oak had that same desire. And also, uh, what I think is important is that the wrong people were running these railroads. And what do I mean by that? I mean simply that uh, we do not have railroad experts really running these railroads. And let me just quote from uh, the Des Moines Register and Leader that editorialized about the problems that faced the Atlantic Northern and Southern in 1911. It said, farming is one thing, building and operating railroads is another. Railroading is not a profitable game for the amateur. And the Volusia Review had this to say about the same time, the history of the Atlantic Northern and Southern Road from inception down to the present time has been more or less a nightmare. It was operated by men who knew little of actual railroading. So yeah, uh, that's a problem. And there's no real evidence that there was ever any kind of uh, collaboration between these operators of short lines. And in fact, when the Wabash was looking at the Ike in 1915, it had a well-known uh, railroad uh, uh, engineer uh, analysts look at it and he just said, you know, I can't even find the records for the company. And they had a number of other related uh, problems. So yes, that's not good at all. Uh, what I can also say is that uh, these railroads uh, did stimulate local communities and consumers benefited. It was pointed out that in Morton Mills, you could pay Velisca prices without going to Velisca. Uh, and also storekeepers in Morton Mills could have a better range of uh, supplies stocked in their stores. And coal prices, that's how people heated their house if it wasn't, well, maybe wood, but coal was often 40 or 50% cheaper if you had direct access uh, by rail. So, what are the uh, long-term uh, uh, results of these railroads? Uh, well, these towns often really didn't make it, as you know, uh, as a result of uh, uh, farm uh, 
mechanization and uh, consolidations. We have a lot of broken communities in Iowa and certainly in southwestern Iowa. Uh, go to College Springs today and you'll see what I mean. Uh, also, uh, let me just say that uh, for the participants, oftentimes uh, uh, they just, um, they suffered financially, as we saw with the uh, uh, the trainer uh, area farmers had invested all these money, all this money. A couple of them lost their farms as a result. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are really unpleasant memories. Uh, when a uh, uh, a video was made uh, of grant uh, for the bicentennial, bicentennial, uh, one of the uh, co-producers or the co-producer pointed out that, you know, bring up the subject of uh, uh, the ANS and people have, uh, you know, bad term memories. And uh, I spoke uh, to a woman who grew up on a farm south of Grant, and she said that her father had invested heavily and he was traumatized by the loss of that money. And she told me, I don't even want to talk about that railroad. Now, physically, uh, we find very little. You can see traces of the right-of-way in places. Uh, but uh, if you go to the Nottoway Valley Historical Museum in Florinda, you can see the uh, the IT people that once uh, served uh, College Springs. Once the railroad was abandoned in 1918, it became converted, it was moved, became a, a farmhouse, or I should say a village house. And then uh, it was moved to Florinda in the not so distant uh, past. So there are not, there's not too much in the way of physical remains. And uh, maybe there are some uh, negative memories still that are passed on from generation to generation, but uh, that's the story. So uh, I'll be happy to take uh, questions if any of you are so inclined. Well, thank you, Roger. We have time to answer two questions. Um, so let's jump in right now. Um, our first question, what got you interested in, in obscure railroad lines and companies? Well, as a resident of uh, Albia, I uh, certainly saw the remnants of, uh, of the abandoned Albia Interurban uh, Railway, later the Albia Light Railway Company. And uh, I don't know, I was sort of intrigued. Uh, in high school, a friend of mine, uh, went out and uh, went to Maxburg and uh, walked a part of uh, the uh, dressing room in Des Moines. Uh, I am not sure why we did that. Uh, I do remember it was raining and uh, uh, the Grand River was flood stage and uh, we uh, got our feet wet and uh, we stepped in cow pies also. So that was one reason. And you know, I'm a railroad historian and uh, I came out of a closet after I wrote several books earlier in my professional career. And uh, let's face it, if you like the subject, uh, you're going to continue working on it and hopefully uh, do well. So I just think that uh, this is sort of significant. It just shows you, you know, the end of a railroad building period. So why did this happen? I think we know why it happened, but there's still that optimism and that determination to succeed. And there are some positive results. Maybe they weren't long lasting, but uh, yes, they tried. And I admire that. And our last question, um, let's look forward to the future. And can you tell us more about your next book? Well, I'm uh, presently uh, writing a, um, a general history of railroads in the Midwest. Nobody has ever done that. There's some debate about where is the Midwest. I view it as eight states rather than uh, states that are on the Great Plains, the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas. And, uh, and hopefully in retirement, I'm approaching the age of 80, it's probably a time to think early retirement. Uh, this will be one of my projects until I uh, uh, disappear from the planet and I'm buried in Oakview Cemetery in Elvia. So there, that's it. Well, a pleasure. <laughs> well, with that answer, we'll bring the webinar to a close. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And one uh, last, extend one last thank you to our presenter, Roger. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories to tell in the upcoming months, and we hope you can join us. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this very series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. 
This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can check out some of our other fantastic digital programs we have, such as our Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians and past programs like this. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again on for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on February 23rd. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.